Beijing claims it's kicked a U.S. warship out of its territory, but the U.S. Navy hits back, saying it's defending freedom for all countries. Australia and Japan are boosting their defense spending. That's as they both face growing military aggression from Beijing. A Chinese businesswoman once enjoyed a great career in China, but that all changed after she received a Chinese-made rabies vaccine some seven years ago. A Chinese state-run media outlet is promoting tourism in China, inviting viewers to visit a Chinese village. Its post came alongside beautiful images of the countryside, but not China's. The real sites actually came from the Swiss Alps. And Washington is postponing a ban targeting companies tied to Chinese military. It was put in place to prevent Americans from unknowingly funding Chinese military development. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Beijing is accusing the U.S. of entering China's territorial waters without permission. This after a U.S. Navy warship entered the South China Sea on Thursday. It is the same warship that passed through the Taiwan Strait on Tuesday. The Chinese Foreign Ministry claimed that Chinese warships and military jets followed the U.S. warship and expelled it from islands in the region. Meanwhile, the U.S. is rejecting what they call Communist China's unlawful territorial claims in the South China Sea. In response to Beijing's claims, the U.S. Navy stated on Thursday, The PLA statement about this mission is false. USS Curtis Wilbur was not expelled from any nation's territory. The operation reflects our commitment to upholding freedom of navigation and lawful uses of the sea as a principle. The Chinese regime claims almost all of the South China Sea. They define the boundary with what they call the Nine Dash Line. But an international tribunal ruled Beijing's claims unlawful in 2016. The tribunal said Beijing should stop using the line to make historical claims to the South China Sea. The region is an important passageway for international trade. Over $3 trillion of trade passed through the region in 2016. And 40 percent of natural gas traded globally in 2017 passed through the waters. China is having territorial disputes with the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia and other countries over the South China Sea. Japan also expressed strong concerns over Beijing's military expansion in the region. It also has territorial disputes with the Chinese regime. The U.S. says it will continue to defend maritime rights and freedoms of all states. Australia's defense spending hit a record high making up almost 2.5 percent of the economy by late last year. This is the highest since the 1990s when the Cold War ended. This move is to respond to Beijing's growing aggressiveness in the region. Australia's defense spending rose from 26 billion U.S. dollars for the past fiscal year to 30 billion U.S. dollars for 2023. That's an increase of 15 percent. The Australian Financial Review cited defense sources, saying Australia is to make a decision by June whether or not to extend the life of some aging submarines. Australian Defense Minister Peter Dutton said in April that conflicts with China over Taiwan should not be discounted. While Australian Home Affairs Minister Mike Pazzullo warned the drums of war were beating. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced last month a 580 million U.S. dollar investment to upgrade military bases. And for the first time, Australia is buying long-range missiles, mainly from the U.S. On top of all this, the Australian government is also reviewing a 99-year lease of Darwin Port on its north coast. A Chinese-owned company is currently leasing and operating it. And the port has great strategic importance in a potential war in the Indo-Pacific area. Japan is set to increase its annual defense spending. The country is ready to raise its beyond 1 percent of the GDP. This 1 percent cap has been a ceiling for Japan for decades. Japanese Defense Minister Nobuo Kishi told news agency Nikkei Asia that due to China's increasing threat, Japan must increase its defense capabilities at a radically different pace than in the past. In the exclusive interview on Wednesday, he also cited new areas of competition, such as space, cyber and electromagnetics. Kishi didn't refer to Beijing directly, but said the security environment surrounding Japan is changing rapidly and with heightened uncertainty. 
This comes as Chinese Coast Guard ships repeatedly enter disputed waters around the Senkaku Islands. Japan administers the islands, but Beijing also claims them and calls them the Diaoyu. The islands are only 100 miles away from Taiwan, and they could be involved in a military conflict in the area. For the third year in a row, Taiwan is ranked the number one place for foreigners to live. This according to German-based expat data company Internations. The company surveyed over 12,000 expats from around the world, living in over 180 countries and regions. And based on their responses, the company ranked 59 countries. Taiwan's healthcare system is one of the top reasons foreigners chose Taiwan. A staggering 96 percent said they like Taiwan's healthcare system, and another 94 percent said it is affordable. An expert from Chile told Internations the Taiwanese healthcare system truly considers people as human beings instead of mere numbers. Security is another factor. It seems like foreigners are extraordinarily happy with how safe Taiwan is. A whopping 100 percent of respondents felt safe living in Taiwan. An expert from Canada said, I can live independently. I feel safe wherever I go. Other things experts like about Taiwan are general quality of life, state of Taiwan's economy and overall job security. Coming in second and third place are Mexico and Costa Rica. Respondents said locals there are generally friendly towards foreigners. China ranked 22nd on the list. Experts said they don't like the fact that there is no internet freedom. Meanwhile, many were also unhappy about the air quality in China. And for the seventh year, Kuwait in the Middle East came in last place. A survey by the Hong Kong Professional Teachers Union shows that about 40 percent of teachers there want to stop teaching. Political pressure is the top reason. The union conducted the survey among roughly 1,200 secondary, elementary, kindergarten and special school teachers and principals. It shows that 19 percent of the respondents have plans to resign or retire early, and 21 percent have no specific plans but are inclined to leave the education sector. Among those who want to stop teaching, about 70 percent of them say it's due to increased political pressure. Some respondents also say that reasons for leaving include having their words and actions restricted, both inside and outside the classroom. They say that politics is overtaking the sector. Since Beijing imposed the national security law in Hong Kong, freedoms in the city's education sector has deteriorated. One Hong Kong middle school teacher tells the Epoch Times he is not surprised that 40 percent of teachers want to stop teaching. He says it is, quote, obvious that education in Hong Kong is becoming a communist one. The CEO of China's ByteDance, co-founder Zhang Yiming, is stepping down. ByteDance owns TikTok, the short video app that has become a global sensation. Zhang made the announcement in an internal memo seen by Reuters on Thursday and said he would be succeeded by co-founder and head of human resources Rubo Liang. The move is the biggest corporate shakeup at the company since its launch in 2012 and comes after several months of deliberation. In his memo, Zhang said he would have a greater impact on the company's longer-term initiatives if he transitioned out of the CEO role. He also confessed to not being an ideal manager. He wrote, quote, The truth is, I lack some of the skills that make an ideal manager. I'm more interested in analyzing organizational and market principles rather than actually managing people. Zhang also called his successor Liang an invaluable partner and that the pair would work together over the next six months to ensure a smooth transition. ByteDance CEO Zhang Yiming isn't the only Chinese tech boss stepping down from his post. In March, Ant Group's chief executive resigned. Ant Group is an affiliate of Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba. In the same month, the chairman of popular shopping app Pinduoduo also left his post. Pinduoduo is a major rival of Alibaba. The day the chairman resigned, Pinduoduo said the company has won almost 800 million customers in the past year. The company said the chairman wanted to do research in food and life sciences. The wave of shakeups follows Beijing's latest crackdown on domestic internet giants. Last month, Chinese authorities summoned over 30 internet titans, including ByteDance. Authorities ordered them to put what they called national interests first and follow the rules of fair competition. Less than a week before that, Beijing slapped a record-high antitrust fine on Alibaba, a whopping $2.8 billion. Also in March, Chinese regulators fined a couple of industry big names, including Beidou and Tencent. 
Bite Dance also felt the pressure. Over the past few months, authorities summoned the company every few weeks. Regulators called on online platforms, including ByteDance, to follow tighter regulations of their financial services. And China's antitrust regulator fined a subsidiary of ByteDance almost $80,000. Authorities allege the company failed to report a previous merger. A businesswoman once had a great career in China, but everything changed when she received a Chinese-made rabies vaccine some seven years ago. Shanghai petitioner Tan Hua attempted suicide on Monday after enduring years of suppression by the Chinese regime. For the past seven years, she petitioned local authorities about her adverse reactions after getting a Chinese-made rabies vaccine, but to no avail. What's the point of being alive? Take a look. Here's a bottle of pesticide. After the 41-year-old petitioner took the poisonous drink, her stomach started aching. Tan's mother tweeted that Tan was later sent to a local hospital for emergency treatments. Under the CCP's authoritarian rule, people are in despair. No jobs, no source of income, silenced by the CCP all year long, completely lost their freedom. So what led to Tan's attempted suicide? Tan graduated from one of the top universities in China with a master's in business administration and was once the vice president of her company. Back in 2014, a dog bit Tan and she had to get vaccinated for fear of rabies. It's an infectious animal disease that can also spread to humans. According to a human rights advocacy website, Tan received multiple doses of a Chinese-made rabies vaccine at a local hospital. After that, she started to struggle with severe health problems, including deafness and brain diseases. Tan not only lost her job, but also had to borrow money to cover her medical expenses, an equivalent of over $150,000. Shanghai authorities deny that Tan's illnesses are related to the vaccine and refuse to pay for her treatments. Tan's mother has also been demanding justice for Tan over the past seven years. My mother is sentenced to jail. The old lady is 75 years old and all her pension benefits are gone. The Chinese regime is also persecuting Tan's mother for petitioning. The regime sentenced Tan's mother to 14 months in jail for giving out flyers on the street about vaccine side effects. In January, authorities forced the mother to abandon her home for seven days and then took away her medical insurance. Tan's mother says she will continue to seek justice. Coming up, a Chinese state-run media outlet is promoting tourism in China, inviting viewers to visit a Chinese village. Its post came alongside beautiful images of the countryside, but not China's. The real sites actually came from the Swiss Alps. More on that after the break. A Chinese state-run media is promoting tourism in China with a stolen photo of the Swiss Alps. A video clip from China's Daily's Twitter account is attracting a lot of attention recently. The state-run media published it earlier this month. The video invites viewers to visit the peaceful getaway and enjoy playtime with their dog in a Chinese village. It says the village is sitting on the foot of the snow-capped mountain. It also has a hashtag that says Glamour China. But people soon found out the picture was not taken in China, but in Switzerland. Renowned Swiss photographer Sylvia Michael shot the original video in a town in the Swiss Alps. China Daily edited the video before posting it on their Twitter account. They flipped the image horizontally, edited its color, and cut off the photographer's watermark. The photographer reported China Daily to Facebook and Twitter. China Daily then quietly took down the stolen footage and did not give any explanation. 
A Chinese province is asking its residents to blow the whistle on anyone they know who is mining cryptocurrency. It's the latest way the Chinese regime is cracking down on cryptos. NTD's Patrick Hayden has more. A Chinese province is asking residents to inform on people they suspect are mining cryptocurrency. Inner Mongolia says the crackdown is to reduce energy consumption, as crypto mining requires a considerable amount of electricity. The province has set up a telephone hotline so residents can report any suspected mining. The Inner Mongolia Development and Reform Commission says they're going to comprehensively clean up and shut down these operations. Markets Insider reports the commission is also targeting companies that are posing as data centers. These businesses get tax breaks, property discounts and cheaper electricity, all of which assists mining. These actions coincide with a growing crackdown in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies across the whole country. Cointelegraph reports that from September 2019 to April 2020, the province was a global hub for crypto mining accounting for nearly 8% of global Bitcoin mining. And Chinese miners account for the vast majority of Bitcoins mined globally. This week, China's central bank said they are not real currencies. The regime wants to promote its digital yuan, which it controls. Following the announcement, Bitcoin slumped as much as 30%. The Chinese regime limits the amount of money individuals can send abroad. So cryptocurrencies are one way Chinese citizens can get around these rules. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. An American grants program is angering Beijing. The U.S. Embassy in China launched the public diplomacy program in grants earlier this year. But the Chinese Foreign Ministry claimed that Americans are trying to trigger a color revolution in China. Color revolutions refer to movements against authoritarian regimes in many post-Soviet states. According to the U.S. Embassy website, the program supports projects that strengthen ties between the people of the two countries. They say the reason is a robust Chinese civil society has the potential to benefit the U.S. The U.S. Embassy will reward projects in areas such as business, education, culture, technology and ethics. There will be open competition and the project should share American values. Applicants may apply for funding up to $30,000. A reporter asked a Chinese foreign ministry spokesman for comments on the program on Wednesday. But the spokesman denied to comment directly. Instead, he referred to the U.S. Congress's Strategic Competition Act of 2021. He claimed the new bill is meant to interfere in China's domestic affairs. He further claimed that the act uses $300 million annually to, as he called, encourage people to spread negative information to discredit China. Senior Chinese media professional Huang Jingqiu told the Epoch Times that the CCP has long brainwashed people through propaganda, so the people have no ability to think independently. Now that the U.S. has opened a window, Chinese people can learn about the real America, and that makes the Communist Party feel threatened. He says once the CCP's brainwashing fails, the enlightened people will demand democracy and ballots, and so on. This is what the authorities call unstable factors. Now we turn to a U.S. investment ban. The U.S. is postponing a ban that bars Americans from investing in Chinese military-linked companies. So investors will have until June 11th to divest their investments. That's two weeks after the original deadline. The Trump administration imposed the ban last November. It said the purpose is to prevent American investors from funding China's People's Liberation Army, or PLA. That's because Beijing is using private companies to help develop the PLA's technology. And these Chinese companies often raise capital in the U.S. by selling securities to Americans. This, as the PLA poses a growing threat to U.S. national security. In January, the U.S. Pentagon added nine Chinese companies to the ban. That includes Chinese phone maker Xiaomi. Xiaomi denies ties to the PLA. It took the U.S. Defense Department to court. About a week ago, the Pentagon agreed to take Xiaomi off the blacklist. The news sent Xiaomi's share jumping over 6% in Hong Kong. And other Chinese companies on the blacklist are reportedly considering similar lawsuits. Authorities in Massachusetts identified a malfunction in the new Chinese-made subway cars earlier this month. That's the fourth time they malfunctioned since they first went into service less than two years ago. 
Chinese state-owned company CRRC assembled Massachusetts' new Red Line and Orange Line cars. The Chinese company will deliver over 400 train cars to Massachusetts over the next few years. This most recent malfunction first started about two months ago. Local transportation authorities had to pull all new trains from service after an Orange Line train derailed. About 100 passengers were on board, but fortunately, no one was injured. The trains will remain out of service before engineers find out the root cause and come up with a solution. These Chinese-made trains had three other malfunction accidents since they first went into service in August of 2019. Authorities had to pull them from service every time. In September 2019, a door on an Orange Line car suddenly opened while the train was in motion. Two months later, a new train derailed while it ran back to the maintenance facility. Then in March 2020, a fault with the bolsters again put the new trains temporarily out of service. In May 2019, U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer asked the federal government to investigate if Chinese-made train cars could pose a threat to national security. Massachusetts state lawmaker Sean Dooley suggested that American cities should stay away from the Chinese state-owned manufacturer. He said no one is under the delusion that communist China is our ally. They have made no secret of their plans for a one-China economy. Dooley went on to say, putting our citizens at risk for a few dollars, especially from a hostile foreign government, is mind-blowing. Uniqlo is the latest brand in trouble over cotton from China's Xinjiang region. Customs documents show that the U.S. blocked imports of some shirts back in January. That was over concerns it violated a ban on cotton products from Xinjiang, where there's a growing evidence of forced labor. A document shows that one shipment was impounded at the port of Los Angeles in January. Uniqlo's parent company protested the move, but it didn't work. Fast Retailing said it was disappointed by the U.S. Customs ruling. An island nation in the South Pacific will cancel a China-backed project. The incoming Prime Minister of Samoa is going to revoke a $100 million port project with Beijing. Samoa's economy relies on farming, tourism, fish exports, among others. It turns to bigger nations for development funding. The Chinese regime was planning to build a wharf there. A local media said the project was in the final stages of negotiation with Beijing. But the island nation's incoming prime minister calls the project excessive. That's because the country already owes Beijing huge debts. The new leader might be able to form a government as early as Friday. Communist China is the single largest creditor in Samoa. The $160 million Chinese loan accounts for about 40 percent of Samoa's external debt. The U.S. and its allies have criticized the Chinese regime for extending infrastructure loans to developing countries. Beijing could potentially turn facilities such as ports into military assets. That would pose a challenge to the U.S. Navy. And that's all for today's China in Focus. But before you go, China in Focus is partnering with the Epoch Times newspaper on their new subscription-based streaming platform, Epoch TV. That's where you can watch our exclusive special reports like this one every Friday night. In them, we'll explore questions like how China lures in foreign companies to steal their technology, how the Chinese regime is actively collecting health data on people around the world, how the ancient Chinese philosophy of good governance differs from the current day communist regime, and much more. Be sure to check out these investigative episodes by clicking on the link in the description down below. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you really want to understand what's happening with China. You can still watch our Monday to Thursday episodes for free on YouTube, NTD Cable TV, the NTD website, and the Epoch TV website. In our next special report, we'll discuss China's ambition to dominate the global monetary system. China is speeding up its plans for digital currency. The digital renminbi is being tested in many regions in China. Building a cross-border payment system to push the use of the Chinese yuan for global trade. All part of a bigger plan to challenge the U.S. dollar. It's all about harvesting part of the dollar hegemony. We can't overthrow the dollar hegemony all at once, but there's every chance. And eventually push the Chinese yuan to dominate the global monetary system. Um, I mean, if you think that the United States has a lot of power through our Treasury sanctions authorities, you, you ain't seen nothing yet compared to 
uh, people who have to transact in digital serialized currency that can be tracked uh, its entire history up to, the, to where it is in a moment. That currency can be turned off uh, like a light switch. But what will it mean for the world when transaction data ends up in the hands of an authoritarian regime known for its surveillance state and strict control over its people? In this special report, we explore how far the Chinese regime has gotten toward forcing its yuan onto the global stage and what risks its success could have for the world economy. Thanks for watching and see you next time.